Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Lewis Miller. Our guest today is Deborah Bose, and she will be talking to us about the Feldenkrais Method, with particular emphasis on its theories regarding human sexuality. Good morning, Deborah. Good morning, Richard. Let's begin with some background, Deborah. Who was Moshe Feldenkrais, and what are the headlines of his theoretical network? So, um, Moshe Feldenkrais, he died in 1982. He was born in the Ukraine. He left there when he was 14 and traveled by himself. His mother sent him away so he would be safe. And he traveled on land by himself to what was then the Middle East, right, before Israel was formed. And he did a lot of manual work and eventually returned to school, got his high school diploma in his early 20s, continued to study, became a physicist and mechanical engineer. When he was working in France, he worked for Madame Curie's lab at the Sorbonne. And when he was working uh, there, he also met Professor Kano, the founder of Judo, and he began to study Judo. And, and Kano chose him to be the person who would bring Judo to the West. He taught Judo in France. He founded the French Judo Academy or French Judo Club. And he studied movement and learning. He was very interested in that. And he developed his method because he became injured playing soccer. During that time, I guess he blew out the ligaments of his knee. And during that time, the surgery was like, they told him, well, it's 50% successful. And he thought, that's really not enough for me. <laughs> so he started to study human movement and how we learn. And during the Second World War, he had to escape. He has a very interesting life. He was pretty much right. a genius. And uh, he escaped from Paris and carried heavy water with him to England, where all of the scientists were sequestered for safety, the Jewish scientists. And he worked on the nuclear submarine program for England. And during that time, he started to give lectures, I guess scientists do when they're all together. And he started to give individual lectures, and that became his first book called Body and Mature Behavior, or the Effects of Sex, Anxiety, and Gravitation. And then from there, when the war was over, he went back to uh, Israel. He started working with people who were referred to him because they had some kind of injury. And he was friends with all of the leaders. With He taught David Ben-Gurion to stand on his head. There's a famous statue on the beach in Tel Aviv of Ben-Gurion standing on his head in the 70s. And through that, then he came to the U.S. He taught at Esalen. He was brought here to develop practitioners by the Humanistic Psychology Institute, which was then in Palo Alto. So that's a general student. Yeah, yeah. So this is a physicist who applied his knowledge to the human body. Is that correct? Yeah. So he looked at the body, like the physical structure of the body. What are the physics? What are the engineering principles that are involved with the use of the body? And then how do we learn? How do we change our self-image? So the movement method is like what gets really a lot of attention because the movements feel nice. Everyone can do them. But it's the shift in your self-image that is the uh, important part. Because one of the statements of Feldenkrais, he has many that we spout, but one of them was, I'm not interested only in flexible bodies, I'm interested in flexible minds. And he said many times in order to practice Feldenkrais method, you have to think differently. So at that time, he was really bringing in systems thinking and the way that everything is interrelated, but especially about how self-image can limit you and how can you change your self-image. So in broad strokes, the Feldenkrais method is a hands-on method. Does the practitioner do something to the patient or client or is it instructions on how to do things or both? So there's two methods. One method or one approach to the method is the hands-on work, and that's called functional integration. And that is where the practitioner will touch the client, but the touch is very different. It's not so much different from like massage or other kinds of manipulations. It's not about doing something to the person. It's more like guiding 
So you might touch a person's shoulder and very gently find out which directions are available for that person to move. And through this touch, which we call more instructive touch, the person recognizes, oh, I'm really resisting you, or I go here, but I don't go there. So in the hands-on method, we usually work with people who have more kind of complex problems, I would say, a lot with people with pain, with neurological conditions, all kinds of movement disorders, children with developmental delay. Then there's this whole other piece of the work called awareness through movement. And awareness through movement is the group process that's verbally directed by the teacher. And so experiential, again, experiential things are hard to describe and have people get a feel for it, but it's based in becoming aware of how you are moving. So even a simple thing such as sitting, we might ask people, we have lessons we do in sitting, like where is the weight? How do you have your sit bones? Is there more weight on one side or the other? Where are you looking? How are you breathing? <clears throat> and we use different positions, sitting, lying on the back, the sides, on the stomach, the legs in different positions, hands and knees. And we explore movements that you do in ordinary life, like reaching or crawling or rolling or lengthening a side or breathing. Breathing's a big component of it too. It sounds like a great deal of the work has to do with expanding personal awareness. Exactly, Richard. It is all about expanding awareness and becoming aware of how you do something and not just how you do it, but how you think about yourself when you do it. So and if I could give an example of that, there's this whole way that people can move that is causing pain for themselves or what I like to refer to as self-violence. And that's a motivation, right? That's a, an idea that you have about yourself that you have to be the best and you have to do it the hardest and you want to really succeed. And we try to work underneath that so that you can discover some principles of moving that also include ideas like kindness and pleasure and self-awareness, because it's not just what you do, it's how you think about what you do. So let's now segue over from the somewhat of a background that you've given us to the connection between the Feldenkrais method and sexuality. So in his first book, The Effects of Sex, Anxiety, and Gravitation, Feldenkrais said that learning, people often stop learning as soon as they achieve a little bit of success. And there are three things in his view that everyone has to figure out for themselves how to deal with. One is that we live in a gravitational field, right? We're always trying to stay without falling. So we all have to learn how to deal with gravity from the time we're babies, how to use gravity for ourselves to roll, how to stand up and balance. Anxiety, I think, is something that he probably suffered or not suffered from, but experienced a lot in his life. And we all have to learn how to deal with anxiety and what is the body pattern of anxiety. And then the other thing is that a mature person has to learn how to deal with being a sexual being. And all of these things, dealing with gravity, dealing with anxiety, and dealing with being a sexual being require learning and practice. And so how can we use that learning and practice to be more skillful in those areas? So and I think, oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. So I was going to say, so also he was a man of his times in the 40s, where ideas about sexual function were quite different than we are, they have now. So a lot of his writing is, I think, really from a male perspective and women being more frigid and more restricted and men being the, the ones who are more expressive. But he developed this work about sexuality. One of his books the he wrote was called uh, The Potent Self. And The Potent Self was written before he developed his work into a whole method. And The Potent Self, he had been working with a man who came to him who had uh, sexual dysfunction, could not have an orgasm except if he hung from a bar, this is not in the book, but it's known that if he hung from a pull-up bar and tightened up his whole body. And Feldenkrais was, became very interested in helping this man and thinking, this is a really smart, intelligent human being. How can he be dis so dysfunctional in this area? 
And he recognized that it's not enough to, to tell somebody what to do. You have to lead them in a process so they can discover for themselves uh, what it is that they're doing and how they might be able to change from that. I think it's interesting that the man figured out that he could have an orgasm from hanging from a bar. How did he ever figure that out? <laughs> I know. How did he? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm still reaching here and trying to understand, trying to get a sense of this method and trying to get a sense of how it applies to uh, to human sexuality. I, I know that he, he had some theories and thoughts about the far reaching role that that religion plays in the distortion of sexuality. And, and right. you want to talk to us about the physical consequences of the role that religion <laughs> played in distorting sexuality? That's a big topic that I'm not really so prepared for, but I can talk about the physical consequences. So, Yes, that's what I'm asking. Okay. So in order to be sexual, you have to have movement and sensation and thoughts, right? So if I can bring this back to his idea about self-image again. So Feldenkrais developed this model of self-image, how we think about ourselves. And his the first uh, line in his book that became very popular was called Awareness Through Movement. And the first line is we act in accordance with our self-image. And how we think about ourselves develops from many aspects, cultural aspects, which would include religious training, of course, your family um, and your experiences. And he broke uh, self-image aspects into four parts. The moving part, like how you move according to your self-image, how you think about yourself, whether you're swagger or you hold yourself tightly. I mean, those are simple, right? How you sense yourself, how you think, and how you feel, your emotional affect. So I can give a little example of that. So I had a young man come to me once who was a pianist, and he came because he had so many problems relating to people, but also so many problems with pain in his hands, which was really related to the way that he carried himself. Like he was, he didn't even sit at the piano. He was always hunched over playing the piano. And at the end of the session, he sat and he looked so powerful and so skeletally connected that he couldn't deal with that self-image. Like for him, I said, you're sitting in a very different way now. Can you sense that? And he said, yes, I cannot sit like this. I said, why not? He said, what will people expect of me? So if you sit where you're open, you're powerful, you're content, you're in your supportive skeleton, you appear differently than someone who's all hunched over and drawn in. So that's the aspect of self-image that we work with Feldenkrais with a lot about the moving aspect. Like how can you move more freely? And the way Feldenkrais relates to sexuality is not so much about changing your thoughts about sexuality, but changing how you move. And he believed, and Feldenkrais practitioners, I think probably all believe this too, that if you change the way you move, you change the way you think. And if you change the way you move, you change the way you sense and feel. So for sexuality, you need a complete freedom of your pelvis and your hip joints and your breathing and the ability to sense and be present in your whole self. You brought up something that that, that Moshe was very, by the way, I, I use it not to be disrespectful, his first name, but I actually have met him and, and chatted with him. And so we were on a first name basis. He puts a lot of emphasis on something called the pelvic floor and the relationship between the pelvic floor and sexual enhancement. Can you talk to us about that, please? Pelvic floor is my love to talk about, and that's what I've done my research on, is like, how can we have better pelvic floor function? So the pelvic floor, of course, obviously people think, ah, oh, pelvic floor is involved with sex, but it's, it has other functions too, which are supportive. It has to hold your organs up. It has a sphincteric functions, right? It's got to keep urine and poop in when you don't want it to come out. And it's involved with balance and movement. So he himself did not develop lessons about the pelvic floor because I think he never really thought of the pelvic floor existing all by itself. 
right? That there's no system in the body that works alone. It's always coordinated with other systems. So in his work, he often refers to the pelvic floor as the area between the legs or the lower part of the pelvis. I don't even know if the pelvic floor was used as a term in his time, but if you want to improve sexuality, you really will be benefited by improving how your pelvic floor functions. And you can see that improvement, not just in sexual function, but in other kinds of functions that the pelvic floor is involved in, such as you can stand on one leg better, or you can not pee your pants. Sorry if I use such common language, but... You can say anything. We're not on uh, regular uh, radio or television. (laughs) Yeah, so if you pee your pants, your pelvic floor is not working, and it's going to affect your sexuality. If you have uh, fecal incontinence, right? If If poop comes out when you don't want it to, that means your pelvic floor is not functioning well. And you can improve that by improving the function of the whole system. Meaning the pelvic floor always works with the abdominal muscles. It always is synergistic with the deep muscles of the back. It's always synergistic with what's going on with breathing and with the, some muscles of the hip. So uh, Feldenkrais talked about having just free movement of your pelvis, free movement of your hip joints. Breathing is always easy and that you can maintain that state when you're also in a sexual situation. Something just happened there that I took note of and I want to comment on. You, you had a hesitation about maybe you made a faux pas by using <laughs> the word P uh, while we're broadcasting. Now, there's a reason why you had that concern. And the reason, I'm, I think, and then please correct me if I'm wrong here, is that there are certain words, utterances, sounds that are illegal to be <laughs> broadcast on air in our country. And most, if not all of those words are related to some form of human functioning that you can trace back to either sex or elimination, such as defecation and urination, you use the word P, and they're related to sex. And so I think that in and of itself is connected to what you're talking about in terms of how the culture is distorting certain aspects of human sexuality, language is an example of it, and creating these anxieties that you're talking about. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah. When I teach my workshops for improving pelvic floor function, people are shocked sometimes if I don't, if I say pee instead of urinate, or if I say uh, penis or vagina, Like those words embarrass people and they're not used to hearing them in public. Everyone has a word for down there, the some kind of uh, made up word to describe, excuse me, the genitals. Yeah, it's so personal too. You've got your clothes off. You show a very personal side of yourself when you're in sexual relations with someone. It's not just, you're not just shaking hands. Like you are exposed, you are vulnerable. And I think some of that goes to this, like the nervous system, like the state one has to be in for for orgasm is a parasympathetic state, right? You have to feel safe, vulnerable, and comfortable. Moshe wrote about some other kinds of things about war and soldiers and men needing sexual release after war. But in my opinion, I think that's really a male perspective or a soldier perspective. Like for most of the women who would come to my workshops, and that's more my experience, in order to have sexual activity and to have orgasm, they need to feel safe, vulnerable, cared for, relaxed. The breathing is free. And when we are in a parasympathetic state, you're just more vulnerable. And in American culture, 
we're often in a sympathetic state, right? Expecting threat, defended, like someone's going to attack you or steal stuff from you, or as a woman walking around, say stuff to you constantly, comment on your hip movement, on your breast, on, on whatever. So people become very defended. And those words that we use can trigger this sympathetic response based on people's experience of I think it that. would be helpful here, Deborah, if you'd go into some description of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems to clarify. Right. I'm not an expert on the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, but, and there's some, there's quite a research about it, that there's a whole nother system, the um, enteric nervous system about the gut. But the simplest way to think about it is that a healthy person is in a parasympathetic state, right? You feel like you're relaxed and you're comfortable and you can breathe. And then something happens. I don't know. There's a scary sound and your nervous system is always ready to protect you. So you go into a sympathetic state, which puts you in a position to respond to threat. And if you have that happen to you over and over and over again, and you don't recalibrate down or learn how to recalibrate down to a parasympathetic state, you are, your nervous system gets fried. You make different chemicals, you, your heart beats faster, the blood goes to your muscles so that you can you know, respond. In all Feldenkrais lessons, one of the things, this is awareness through movement, but also the hands-on work functional integration, people get into a parasympathetic state, which allows them to feel more of themselves, right? If you're scared, you don't feel your whole self, but if you're relaxed, you can have awareness of your whole body. You can be more sensitive in your whole body. And I think that's how Feldenkrais lessons also help people for sexuality, that they know what parasympathetic feels like. They know what their breathing feels like. They know how their whole idea of themselves, they can feel their whole body when they're in a parasympathetic state, if you can recognize that. Is that clear for you? Is that, am I answering your question? I, I'm trying to picture where my pelvic floor is and, mm. and how do I and how do I relate to it? How do I move my body in such a way as to get uh, enhance my awareness of my pelvic floor? I'm, you right. know, I'm trying on these different things that, as you're saying them. My sense of fright, or when you <laughs> talked about the person who sat all crunched over, so I tried sitting all crunched over to feel what that felt like in terms of what I'm saying to myself and to the world. And then I tried sitting in the other position that you said he was sitting with at the piano, which he felt uncomfortable uh, sitting at because of what he was saying to the world. That it's, yeah, it's I understand, Richard. This is a problem because in a conversation like this, we're, we're not completely relaxed. We're not really, I'm not expecting threat. I don't think you're expecting threat. No. But it requires a different set of conditions to feel yourself. So it's more like, Hypnosis, right? If you're going, some people have compared Milton Erickson's work with Feldenkrais's work, the Milton Erickson with hypnosis. You have to be in a different state in order to sense yourself because your nervous system is a fantastic system, but it can only do so much. Right now, our nervous systems are keeping us alert to pay attention to each other, to be in relationship with each other, to stay sitting and not fall over to listen, to try to understand. And so we want to knock that out. We want to knock that out in order for you to have more somatic or bodily awareness. So if I can give you an example, when I teach people how to find the pelvic floor, like that's my whole thing is, can you be aware of it? And then once you're aware of it, do you know what you're doing with it? When is it involved? So I begin with a breathing sense uh, lesson where I ask people to use different sounds on the exhale, of course, to feel the activation of the abdominal muscles and possibly the pelvic floor. But most people aren't going to feel it at first. It requires going deeper, 
lowering the threshold of excitation in your system so that these more subtle sensations can come forward. Like you can make a fist with your hand and you can tell I'm making a fist with my hand, but to tighten your pelvic floor, people can't feel that because there's no joint movement. We can feel the hand move or we can feel the elbow move because there's joint movement. The pelvic floor is a bunch of soft muscles that only tighten and relax. They get shorter or they get a little longer and not even that long. So when you said people can't feel the pelvic floor, I immediately tried to feel what whatever my pelvic floor is. And I found myself doing something that's called the Kegel. Is there right. some relationship? Tell us the relationship between wh what I'm doing when I'm doing a Kegel and finding my pelvic floor. So Kegels from Dr. Kegel, Dr. Arnold Kegel. He's the first one who thought that women should be able to improve the function of these muscles. So he developed a series of exercises for women. He did some very interesting research, watching people pee from below and what happened to the pelvic floor and all that stuff. He developed a series of exercises where you used a little pressure sensor for women you put the pressure bulb in your vagina, and it, as you squeeze the muscles in your vagina, the pressure would go up on this little meter. So that became the kind of idea of kegels. Oh, you just squeeze down there, like you don't want to pee or you don't want to pass gas. Everyone knows how to hold it a little. That's the pelvic floor, but there's a lot more to it than that. Oh, but that is the pelvic floor when we yeah. do. Well, okay, that helps. So that means okay. w w when I'm doing something to make sure I don't pee in my pants or defecate in my underwear, I'm I, I, and I'm squeezing. That's the pelvic floor. Correct. That's okay. The pelvic floor. All right, we're getting somewhere now. People <laughs> can understand. So all of you out there, you just remember: if you want to know where your pelvic floor is. Just tighten up as if you want to hold urine or defecation or releasing of gas, and then you're on your pelvic floor. And th that is similar when you do that motion internally to doing a Kegel. Is it's the same thing. It's a Kegel. It's the same thing. Okay. Now, that research about Kegels, so it used to be taught, women were taught, like, because women are less aware of the sensations in the pelvic floor than men. Really? Because the anatomy, women have a vent. They have three openings for pee, for the vagina, and the anus, right? So they've got the urethra, the vagina, and the anus. And men only have two openings. And Trash. women pass babies through this vagina, which is like pushing a football out. And so those muscles get stretched, and they need to be brought back into normal use. So where you can sense it right now, you say, oh, I just contract that. I can feel it. That's fantastic. That's the goal of the program that I've developed. But the women that I work with often can't feel that. They don't know what they're doing. And they can't pull in on their anus? Or they can, but they don't sense it. They don't sense it. They do, Or they can pull in on their anus, but they can't pull in on the vagina. Oh, right? I'm doing or it right can, now as we're talking. And I can feel everything in there. I feel my penis sort of contracting and I can right. feel, it feels like my anal sphincter is tightening up and contracting. In fact, exactly. I'm, sure, I'm sure it is. I'm, exactly. Without, so putting think, a, without putting a bulb in there. That's right. Men can usually do that. Men, in my experience, usually have more difficulty with over contracting the pelvic floor. This is a total generalization. Oh, we tighten up too much? Yeah. They tighten up to make an orgasm. They tighten up to make a thrust. But you can have other movements to move your pelvis so that you don't have to tighten your pelvic floor to have a thrust like that. Women don't feel it as much. And I think even I remember my brother as a little boy could go outside in the snow and he loved to pee in the snow and make these shapes. <laughs> of course. All of us. Snow. I think all little boys love doing that. In boy. fact, I still like doing that. You it's still a lot of fun. <laughs> And he could do it, right? He could move the shape merely by contracting the pelvic floor in different ways. Women don't have that experience. Well, say damage. But if you practice with a partner and you're having intercourse with a partner, your partner, there may, if it's a male partner, 
they or a, a hand, you, the person you're with can feel if you are contracting your pelvic floor. So that's well, one way to play with well, it. I was interviewing somebody recently and, and she was telling me that she's teaching women how to contract the vaginal muscles so that it feel men feel like their penis is being stroked by right. the inside of the vagina. Those people must be in graduate school to be able to do that. If you're saying right. that just the awareness of the area is difficult in and of itself. Right. Because, so the thing, Richard, is that the pelvic floor doesn't work by itself. So this is what recent research has. And this is the crux of my study. It used to be women were taught Whenever you pee, stop the flow of urine. Always stop the flow of urine several times. That can really screw things up for you. They're taught because that when, to, while they're urinating to suddenly re retain the urination? Yeah, to stop it. Put the brakes on. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, but what that's not the, a good what, way to do it. What was the purpose of that? Because if you can stop urine coming out when you're peeing, that means you have a really strong pelvic floor. And so women, it's a good way to test. I see. Okay, if you say so. <laughs> it's a whole different world for men and women's sexual and sexuality, right? So, yeah, so women post-birth are often incontinent because those muscles have been stretched so much. Wait a minute. It, the muscles of the vagina have been stretched, but how does that affect the urethra, which carries the urine? Yeah, so the urethra is not a contractile it's organ. Just a it's just a tube. So what you can, when you need to pee, what blocks the urethra are the vaginal muscles, the pelvic floor muscles. Everything down there contracts to put the brakes on and the urethra gets squeezed together. And the physiological thing that happens is that the bladder, okay, so the bladder is a hollow organ, right? It holds urine. When you have to pee, the urine in the bladder stimulates some of the nerves. It goes to your brain and says, hey, hey. I need to empty. And then the bladder should do all the work. So the bladder will contract and push the urine out. When the bladder contracts to push the urine out, the pelvic floor relaxes to allow that to happen. So when you contract the pelvic floor, that puts the brakes on the bladder. So there is a reflex that's really important for men and women to know about that Peeing requires relaxation. So the pelvic floor can relax and the bladder can do its job. You don't push the pee out. And if you are always stopping that reflex, so you pee, you put the brakes on, you pee, you put the brakes on, you pee, you put the brakes on, pretty soon you totally mess up that reflex. And women then get this hyperactive bladder where they have to pee every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes, because they have wrecked the normal reflexive relationship. As a function of anxiety and tension, is that what, what's causing that? Or it could be that, or it could just be they trained themselves to interfere with it. So when women are, are find themselves urinating very frequently, like once an hour, it could be because they have mistrained their own system? Is that what you're saying? That there's many reasons. That could be one reason that... And men too, men often will pee every hour, but that has more to do with when they're older and the prostate's big yeah. and pulling and pulling down. But for women, this is a very complex system to describe. So in a few words for women, the and for everybody, the bladder will give you a message that you have to pee with just the lower third of the bladder full. So you shouldn't pee as soon as you get your first urge, if you're a woman, wait a little bit. Then I'm trying to get my train of thought back here. If you pee whenever you get the first urge to pee, right? why do women do that? Because they leak and they're afraid of leaking and they don't want to cough or sneeze and wet their pants. So they pee too much and then they've trained their bladder to be super sensitive to the smallest amounts of urine and they can't ignore that sensation that they have to pee. So one of the reasons why they leak, or the main reason why they leak, is that the pelvic floor muscles are not strong enough. The whole system is not working well. 
So when you cough or sneeze or laugh or jump or walk, there are synergistic movement patterns that happen through the whole body. One of the systems is the pelvic floor system. So the pelvic floor muscles that hold your organs in, keep the urine in, is also works with the abdominal muscles, the deep muscles of the back, and the hip rotators. So if you have had surgery on your abdomen, or you have had a vaginal birth, or maybe even trauma, sexual trauma, or any kind of trauma really, but sexual trauma, or you've had a back injury, or you've had hip replacements or hip surgery, an aspect of the pelvic floor system will be weaker, which means your pelvic floor will probably also be weaker. So that's why you have to work with the whole system. And if you can strengthen the system, you're not going to wet your pants. Now, you've got to make a jump for us here because we're spending a great deal of time talking about urination. And I wanted us to be talking about (laughs) sexual functioning because one of the claims that the Feldenkrais method makes, if I understand correctly, is that the Feldenkrais method will improve your sexual functioning and your sexual enjoyment. Am I correct? That claim is made? That claim, maybe some people make that claim. More, I would say that Feldenkrais claim is that Feldenkrais will improve all function. So Feldenkrais himself said, if you improve one function, you improve them all. If you improve your ability to sit well and have skeletal balance, that will improve many other functions. If you improve the function of controlling your urine, it will improve the use of the pelvic floor for all of its functions, sexuality. It doesn't do a thing for how you think about sexuality, but it does a whole lot for how you can use your musculature to do what you want to do. But if if your muscles, as you said before, impact how you think, then conversely, doesn't how you think affect your musculature? Yeah, actually, what I didn't say was your muscles affect how you think. Your movement affects how you think. And then your thinking thinking must affect how you move. Exactly. It's all, it's the thinking affects how you move. Your feeling affects how you move. Your sensation affects how you move. You can't work. It's a very Western way of looking at it that you affect, you can just choose. I just want to be a better sexual partner. In that case... Everybody in the United States must be screwed up in the muscles because (laughs) the entire culture is misguided and distorted with regard to their thinking about sexuality. And so their thinking must be creating these, 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 these muscle tensions on a chronic basis all the time. Yeah, it could be, but I don't think everybody is screwed up. I think there's well, a if, whole if, lot if, of people are. Well, <laughs> I live in San Francisco. If you live in one of the most progressive cities in the whole world, and people in your classes are embarrassed when you use the word P, what does that tell us about the rest of the country if you want to talk about things like sexual intercourse or oral sex or even having sex? That's why mm-hmm. I, I made the jump that the, <laughs> the muscle tension must be of phenomenal proportions in this country, but particularly in this area you call the pelvic floor. Because if if I'm starting out by thinking that sex is shameful or sex is dirty or anything to do with my penis is shameful or dirty, my gosh, I, 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 I must be constantly walking around in a state of tension all the time. I think that's probably true. That's interesting. When I started doing my research about the pelvic floor and was writing my dissertation and at a party, a man would say, oh, what have you been doing? It's, oh, I've been doing this research. So what about? It's, oh, the pelvic floor. It's because pelvic floor health, if you can really use your pelvic floor, you don't need Viagra. And as soon as I would mention pelvic floor, to a man in regards to erection, I'd be like, oh, I'd be standing alone in the crowd. How say some more about that? I would love to learn more. I mean, at 83 years of age, I'll take all the help I can get regarding sexual functioning. <laughs> That's great. So that will, it's so interesting because I do work with men who have enlarged prostates, 
men who have, I'm in San Francisco, there's a huge gay population, right? The easiest men for me to work with are gay men because they all talk about it. They will consider it. They are not shy. Straight men, oh my God. Straight men referred by their wives, the worst for me to work with. Because they're, tell us more about them. What What is their t- distinguish between the straight guys and the gay guys? In ter- what, what's going on there? Teach us. So straight men are so embarrassed. It's almost like they don't. About, about functioning, sex, about, about penis. About sexual function. Yeah, because it means that they're less than, right? I can't get it up. I can't get it up. So I am I'm less of a man. And a gay man, sexuality is in, that's, they, they opened up so many sexual barriers and inhibitions. They are very open about talking about it. And they're just so wonderful to work with because they listen, they learn, they'll tell me what's happening. If I ask a man, a straight man, so what about erections? It's just kind of, they're okay. A gay man's going to give me, this happens, this happens, I have an orgasm, this happens. There's much more ability to talk about it. Although I did have a straight man recently come to me who was very lovely, a European man, who had a lot of pain when he would have an erection and an orgasm. And he would have a lot of back pain. Pain in his back from an erection and an orgasm. And that makes sense to me because the pelvic floor contracts really fast when you have an orgasm. I forgot about the figure, but lots of contractions. And the pelvic floor is related to the low back muscles as a synergistic piece. So if you have trouble with the orgasm or your back, that all the contractions of the pelvic floor can cause more contraction in the back. It's like it happens from your habits throughout your life. So it's like a family, right? If one, so family systems in psychotherapy, right? If one member of the family is doing too much, the others aren't doing enough. And the pelvic floor system is like a family. And the family is the back muscles, the belly muscles, the abdominals, the muscles inside the pelvis and the hip muscles and the breathing. And you need to have that whole balance of all of those systems for it to work well, something else you said here just struck <laughs> a little note with me. And then you, when you talked about men having this anxiety about getting it up, it's as if men think that it's their responsibility or they've been taught that mm. it's their job or their adequacy is dependent upon their ability to take control of a bodily function that they would never think of taking control of with regard to most all other bodily functions. For example, you don't hear people say, oh, darn it, I just don't know how to make myself sweat. Oh, I feel so terrible today. I I was around a bunch of onions and I just couldn't get myself to cry. So these are automatic functions. But suddenly, or I don't know what's going on, but I can't make my nails grow. It would be absurd. You don't hear people saying things like that. Why can't I take control of my hair and make it grow longer? You don't hear that. But you do hear, I can't get it up, as if they're supposed to take volitional control of something that obviously is a process that's built into the system for the purpose of inserting this member into the vagina in order to meet with the egg when the sperm come out and and procreate. So survival depends on these organs getting up. And yet we seem to have taught men that it's their, quote, job, unquote, to get it up as if it it becomes a task. And then, of course, we talk about success in in the task as having achieved an orgasm. And then we talk about continued <laughs> success by saying, I maintained an orgasm. As if it's, it's a, now it's a maintenance job. First it's, <laughs> first, first, it's a construction job, getting it up. And, and then it's a success job, achieving. And then it becomes a maintenance job. We've turned sex into a lot of work, it sounds like. I think that's interesting. I've never heard of it described like that, but that's, I like that. So that's the thing about pelvic floor function. So, because 
the pelvic floor pumps the blood into the penis to make it hard. Well, it's blood flow. It's blood flow that makes the penis hard. Now, the pelvic floor can assist with that pumping, or it can interfere with it by being too strong. And I think that where people get caught, or maybe men get caught, is that there is an autonomic, automatic thing that happens with the pelvic floor, just like with your breathing, right? So if you are relaxed, <clears throat> your breathing is open and free. If you get scared or sad or something happens to you, your breath responds without you having to say, oh, do this. And the pelvic floor has those same things happen, that the pelvic floor will respond to emotional stressors and get tighter. And so if it's too tight, you can't get blood flow in there. If it's too unusable, too loose, you can't get blood, blood flow in there. It's this balance. It's this balance. And I think maybe that's where people get stuck. Like sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And the factors that make it work sometimes and not make it work sometimes could be physical. You have pain or you have had surgery or something. It could be in your affect. It could be in your thought processes. It could be in the environment and the situation that you're in. And I think that's what I love about the complexity of helping people improve pelvic floor awareness and function is that you've got to consider something that isn't just one thing. It's not like closing your fist. It's just got every, you know, a whole bunch more connected to it. What about athletics? Uh, do certain kinds of athletic activities have a positive effect on the pelvic floor? They can, certain kinds of athletic activities can have a positive effect. There were there was a study, however, that looked, I don't remember the authors, but that looked at teenage girl runners. And one of the measures that they use a lot is, are you incontinent? Can you use the pelvic floor in one of its primary functions, which is to keep urine and poop in? So they looked at these young girls who were 17, uh, around 17 years old, and found out this is so interesting, that the girls who had very stiff arches of their feet were incontinent. Now, that's a fact that fascinates me. So there are some dancers. In order to dance and be upright, the direction is often pull up from your pelvic floor. Now, that can become a habit. And if that's a habit, dancers can have too much contraction in the pelvic floor. And therefore, the pelvic floor doesn't work. Maybe they can't even be entered for intercourse or it's they're too tight and the muscles lose their ability to contract. It's just like a, a fist again. If I keep my hand in a fist all the time, I lose power in my hand. It, pretty soon I get the white, the, you can see there's no blood flow in the hand. The muscles start to cramp up. The same thing can happen in the pelvic floor if you over contract it. So I would say dancers are probably more at risk for over-contracting pelvic floor. People who do Pilates are often at risk of over-contracting the pelvic floor because in my experience, I've always had two or three Pilates teachers in my classes who complain of a too tight pelvic floor. So a woman with a too tight pelvic floor can't be entered easily just from muscular work. It also could be that it's an emotional thing or a historical thing, or a thought thing that makes the woman too tight to be entered. Yeah, interesting. Are you implying that a significant percentage of females suffer from some form of urethral leaking? The statistics are pretty high <clears throat> that as women get older, they leak more, but it's, yeah, it's like one out of four. Some of the studies are one out of four, one out of five women have this problem. And when you say leaking, are we talking about drops that that accumulate in their underwear, or, or are you talking about water uh, urine leaking down their leg and and really uh, significantly yeah. copious amounts? There are measurement tools for that. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> so is it like a dime size drop of urine, or a quarter size, or if people remember half dollars, half dollar, or is it a total whoosh? All you have to do, Richard, is go to Walgreens or. CVS and go to the diaper aisle for adult diapers 
I don't remember those things they being there when I was a kid. But incontinence <laughs> incontinent supplies are a huge business. It is big business. Incontinence is the number one reason why people are admitted to a nursing home. Yes. Wow. And, and, and so that's why I talk about incontinence a lot. It's funny because I used to have my workshops and I would say, do you leak urine? Come to my workshop and learn about that. No one would come. So then I described it more as develop more awareness of your pelvic floor. And people came and what they wanted to talk about was leaking and also sexuality. I can tell you personally that that holding my urine has become uh, more difficult with age, particularly once I passed 80. I, mm. I, I, I really know now that when I feel like I have to urinate, I've got to move quickly to get to the bathroom because if I don't, I could begin to leak. And yeah, so I've learned to to do the Kegel, really, really do it and ho to hold it in. And sometimes I've I've gone to the extent of pinching the end of my penis while I'm making that, my mm -hmm. way to the bathroom in order to make certain that I don't urinate. Yeah, those are all great things. Now, I would suggest a couple of things. One, when you do a Kegel, that you also pull in the abdomen because that is part of the system and you'll get a stronger Kegel and you do the Kegel to sh turn off the bladder. Hey, I'm in charge of you. The other thing is, this is one fact I love, count how long you pee because normal peeing is between eight and 15 seconds. How's that for a fact, right? That's a, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> it is good because if you pee all the time, a lot of women pee or men pee after and they only pee for four or five seconds. You didn't have to go. Your bladder is now in charge of you, rather you in charge of the bladder. And that means your sexual function is going to be diminished. So you count the number of seconds every time you pee, and then you start to re whoops, relate that sensation in your what your body was feeling, what you were feeling in your body to, did you really have to pee? And it's related to pain. I used to work at in pain programs. And one I worked in, this were people who were injured on the job but had no objective findings. And they would see me for uh, two hours a day. And then they would see the psychologist for two hours a day for one month. And I discovered in that program that people with pain were getting up to pee at night six to eight times a night, never having restorative sleep. And that can be, and then they were peeing, what, four or five seconds. That's not, you didn't have to get up. You need to learn how to turn off your bladder. And we didn't really, I didn't really talk well, to them about Well, what's happening with those function. people is that they're getting some kind of a message internally that's actually waking them up. They're not right. deciding to get up every hour to pee. They're getting a message that says you better get up or you're going to pee in the bed, right? And they can turn off. That's right. And then you can turn off that message by really developing the power of your pelvic floor contraction with the abdominal contraction to turn off that message so you don't get it. It might take three to four nights to eliminate that. Like normal waking up to pee one to two times a night. If you're waking up six to eight times, how can you ever recover? Your whole system is uh, out of whack. But normal is one or two times a night. Yeah. We're becoming experts on urination, but I don't know how it, I don't know how it relates yet to improving our sex life. Ever, I've always thought that Moshe said that with that, that uh, but he, he never taught me how to do it. But I always th thought he said that Feldenkrais can improve your sex life. And that's what I. Yeah. What I, and that's what we so, all want. That's what we all want to know about. We've got to get to the, to the meat here. How do you improve okay. your sex life with Feldenkrais? So the way you improve your fel sex life with Feldenkrais is you learn how to have a free pelvis, that your pelvis can move in all directions, free hip joints, your spine, your breathing. Those are the lessons that will improve your movement so that you have available movement for your sex life. I remember one guy coming to me and saying, could you teach my girlfriend to touch me the way that you touch? Why? Yeah. So how do you have sensitivity in your hands? Do you touch someone the way you want they want to be touched? That you can learn from Feldenkrais so that it's not just about your pelvic floor, but the function of urination and how good you have control of that is a function of how healthy and operating your pelvic floor is. That's something we can talk about. Was it Moshe that taught 369? 369? Well, you sit in a chair 
Yeah. And you move your, your pelvis. I, it's something I've taught myself. I thought Moisha might have taught me that. I don't know where I learned it. But you sit, I sit in a chair and move my pelvis as far to the right as I can. That's three. Then I push all the way back. That's six. Then all the way to the left is nine. And then all the way forward is 12. Three, six, nine, 12. Go around in circles. And then the other reverse. 12, 9, 6, 3. 12, 9, 6, 3. Is that a, 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 an exercise mm-hmm. you're familiar with? Yeah, that's what's called the pelvic clock that we do oh, in many different variations. Uh-huh. The pelvic clock. So if you can have free movement in all directions like that with the pelvic clock, that is fantastic. The people <laughs> I work with, they can't do that. They can't do it. They can't sense they're doing it. Now, what's interesting about that, Richard, is you can use the pelvic clock, but do it by contracting your pelvic floor to move your pelvis. When I met, to do a kegel. When I met my wife on my birthday at Wilbur Hot Springs, we were sitting at a table. And very often when I'm sitting at a table, I'll do the what you call the pelvic clock. I'll do my three six. Mm-hmm. I like to just continue to do it at various times during the day. And I've trained myself to do that, uh, going back to Esalen in the 60s. <laughs> but I, And I don't think about it. I'm just sitting there very quietly. I'm not making big, gross movements. And I don't even, I, I haven't even been aware that anybody could even notice it. And sometime later, my wife said to me, who, the woman who became my wife, she said, when I met you and you were doing those thrusts and things with your <laughs> pelvis under the table there, she said, I thought you were making some kind of quite a, a remarkable passes at me isn't that interesting like that movement a natural movement is interpreted in a sexual context yes she must have had a little attraction to you too though. oh she had a lot of attraction it was love <laughs> at first sight we've had quite a cosmic relationship so listen so the, this is, i know we're getting close to the end but yes. when you do the pelvic clock now one of the things that i teach people to do is to do a kegel and when you do a kegel do you go more to six o'clock or twelve o'clock or three o'clock or nine o'clock. There are habits of the use of the pelvic floor and you can practice. You'd have a lot of fun with this. I can see you doing it. I actually can <laughs> see me doing it on the Zoom. I, as soon as you're talking, see everything you're saying uh, throughout this interview, I've been trying out and doing. So uh, so when you said, see where your body moves when you do the Kegel, I immediately did it. I, I go to 12 o'clock when I do the Kegel. Ah, okay. So that's your habit, right? Yeah. Now, can you go to six o'clock as you do a Kegel? Sure. All right, great. Can you go to nine o'clock? Oh, I can go anywhere. Oh, your mom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a great observation. My whole body shifted. Huh? My exactly. Mouth, I did a three, six, nine, twelve with my mouth. Exactly. Well, so that's how Feldenkrais helps sexual function. Well, it's a great exercise. Do that. This is something we want to get across, you know, to folks. This, the, this three, the, what you're calling the pelvic floor exercise, three, six, nine, twelve, is a wonderful exercise because you can do it when driving a car. Safe. You can dr- do mm-hmm. it at the dinner table. You can do it at your desk. You can do right. it anywhere else. It's really great. But as your pre-wife noticed, someone might uh-huh. interpret that, the interpretation. And then if that gets interpreted, then a person can become very inhibited as a child even, and not do any movements of the pelvis. And then that becomes a problem later on. When my daughter was, uh, one of my daughters was 10, she came home and she said, mom, the kids are making fun of me because they say I swing my butt too much when I walk. And I watched her and it's, no, no, you don't swing your butt too much. But if that had stayed with her and she became inhibited over time from her culture, then she would have lost that movement of her pelvis, which would later years affected her sexual function. Yeah. So let's make believe <laughs> this interview is over, even though it's okay. not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so the interview is over and you're sitting there in your office and you're saying to yourself, oh, I wish I would have said this or, oh, I wish I would have said that. <laughs> so take a few seconds now before we end and see if there's anything that comes to mind that if we would have ended now, you would wish you would have said. I think the, I think I've said everything I want to say. It's been really fun talking to you. So you're the kind of client I would love to have because you're open to talking about it. That's what it requires because with your open to talk about something, you have the possibility of developing awareness. Deborah, right? I am deeply in a belief system 
that everything that comes out of our mouths are sounds and that we've given names to these sounds called words. We have made up these words. We have taken sounds and agreed upon certain sounds having certain meanings. And that's what we call language. And, and from my perspective, any sound that you make or I make is okay to do what we call talking about. There's no mm -hmm. such a thing for me as certain topics that you can't talk about. I, I think to have a topic, an utterance, words, language that you can't talk about is stiflingly ridiculous. I agree. I totally agree. I, that's the, yeah. I think, Richard, the one thing I would say is that it's the kind of thing of contracting the pelvic floor from different directions that is really fun to practice with a partner in intercourse. Ah, because now we're right? getting to the sexy stuff, right? At the... <laughs> so that you can practice with your partner and say, ah, can you feel this? Ah, can you feel this? Now I'm contracting from the front of my pelvic floor. Ah. Now I'm contracting from the back of my pelvic floor or the right or the left. And then your partner can do the same things. And you can say, oh, I feel that more on the right, more on the left, because we all have habits of use of the pelvic floor that affect all functions. I happen to focus more on continence, but affects sexual functions also. Sure, what a great idea. People can do 36912, the pelvic floor exercise, while they're having intercourse. And they can do threes together, or a three and a six, or a nine and a three, and have all kinds of fun. Now- All kinds of fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and do what Moisha promised, which is enhance their sexuality. Thank you very much, Richard. It's been lovely <laughs> talking to you, Deborah. Thank lovely you very too. much. <laughs>